Okay, folks, let's begin. All right, so first of all, you guys know there's a couple help sessions tonight. They're com they're apparently, they're competing help sessions. They occur at the same time. <laughs> One's for MATLAB, because that homework is due Wednesday, and I think that is going to be in the crib. He sent out a note. You could read your email, but I think 5.15 to 7.15 or something he said. And then there's another one in wherever they've been taking place. 261, is that right? Um, and that's for the exam. All right. So there's an exam on Thursday. The exam is in class. Um, it'll take, well, you'll have the class time to do the exam. I already prepared it. Um, so what do I want to say about it? It's going to look a lot like the homework problems you've been getting that are from me, not the book, but the ones that I give you that are all spelled out. That's, it's going to be that type of problem, okay? Um, I've had a couple of questions about, like, can people use tablets? And so I guess, I guess so. We'll have a bunch of people walking around, so don't try to do anything with your tablets that you shouldn't be doing. But um, all the work is meant to be done analytically, right? I'm giving you simple problems. You can do everything. Yeah? Yeah, of course, yeah. And it's open book, open note. So by open book, open note, I mean you can bring in your book. Um, you can bring in all the notes from the class. You can bring in all your homeworks, stuff like that, okay? I don't mean if you happen to have access to all the, it won't help you, but if you happen to have access to all the homeworks I've ever assigned or exams I've ever given, that's not what I mean, even though it won't be of any help to have that because every exam is created from scratch, okay? All right. Um, so I think that addresses, um, uh, do you have any questions about the exam? Let's put it that way. Yeah? What have you found the best way for people to study for the exam? Okay, so the question is, what's the best way to study for the exam? Uh, we put up a problem. See, the, the course is a little bit different now because we used to do um, linear algebra, ODs, and stats because that's because the juniors had ODEs already, but now it's stats, linear algebra, ODEs. So that means all the statistics problems that I could give you are on the final exams, the previous final exams. So um, we took one off one of the previous exams and that's posted now along with the solution. So I would start by working that problem, not with the solution. <laughs> Because the nature of that is if you do the exam and the solution is sitting there, you go, this is pretty simple, actually. <laughs> it's when you don't have the solution is when it looks hard. All right. So you should try to do that problem without the solution. And, and then I would just work backwards in the homeworks, the written homeworks. So what, you've had three, is that right? Three written homeworks so far? So I would do the third written homework, second written homework, first written homework, um, backwards. Okay. And I would focus mainly, if you don't have enough time to do everything, on the problems that are written, not the ones from the book. The book, are, there's nothing wrong with the ones in the book. It's just not my own style, right? If, if that's what you want to call it. And so it's better to focus on the kind of problems that I would typically give you on the test, which look like the ones on the homework. Okay? I wouldn't read the book. Uh, well, okay, let me rephrase that. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't just sit and read the book, right? Everything I, you need to know is in the notes that I've given you. The only thing that you need in the book that's not in notes is the tables. There are tables 7, 8, 9, and 10. Those are like um, the normal distribution, the t-distribution, the chi-squared distribution. You need those tables. Okay. Um, so basically, if you know everything in the notes, another thing you can do is go through the practice problems on, in the notes. All the notes that I've got in class have practice problems spread throughout them. If you can do those, you should be in good shape. All right. Um, yeah, and then sleep, you know. Sometimes I get people, they're like, I totally bombed the exam. My first question I always go, when did you go to bed? The night before, and they're like, four. And I'm like, so, I mean, if you don't know the material at like at, at midnight the night before, you're not going to probably figure it out. So, at least being rested allows you to adapt, right? Because the test is going to consist mainly of things that almost, I should say almost entirely of things you've seen before in, I wouldn't call it verbatim, but things it doesn't take any real thinking to do, you know. Like if you can do, if you understand what I did in class, you just extrapolate, not, not even extrapolate, interpolate and just do a new problem with new numbers kind of thing. There'll be one or two things on the exam that test your understanding to do something we haven't done exactly in class, okay? But I don't want an exam where 
Um, I do nothing but have you do stuff you did in class or an exam where I do nothing. You ever had an instructor like that? You take an exam and you're like, that didn't, that didn't have anything to do with the class I took. <laughs> so we won't have an exam like that. Okay. There will be one or two things that uh, tr I try to test your ability to understand the material beyond what's just written hard you know, in the slides. Just extrapolate a tad, not much. Did someone have a question over here? Yeah? Uh, since we, you didn't really have example problems on probability, probability theory, or is that not going to be a big portion of the exam? Um, well, you know, the, the, I don't tend to give a lot of those, but I never want to say, you never say always or never, okay? But, um, you know, but like, for example, how to use the, nor how to use the tables for the normal distribution and calculate probabilities, that might be pretty reasonable, you know? So I think I gave you a couple problems out of the book on that, right? So that probably, so I gave you problems out of the book because if I didn't have problems prepared already, I just didn't have time to prepare homework problems from scratch all the time. So I gave you those out of the book because I didn't have ones like that. But if I gave you a homework problem on something, then it, then it suggests I probably think it's important enough where it could be on the test. So I'm just saying the style of the problem is going to be like the ones I wrote. Yeah. They tend to be, here's the problem, part A, B, C, D, E. No, I'm kidding. Um, so they'd be multiple part questions. And, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just the, I'm just saying those would be good because you get used to the style. Yeah. The only thing I might ask you to do in MATLAB is like, let's say for example, you wanted to calculate, um, uh, trying to think of a good example. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I might ask you to, <laughs> why am I coming up blank? Let me, let me help myself. I'm not as smart as I would, I'm not gonna look at the exam, I'm gonna look at my lecture notes because I can't even remember what we covered. It's not a good sign. I've been out of town, so. All right. Um, so for example, we did um, confidence intervals, right? Okay. So, I, so what, what is the test going to consist of? You doing the analytical calculations that we have in the notes. There's an example for everyone I would ask you to do, okay? Then I might say something like, if you wanted to do the same thing in MATLAB, what would the command be to do it? You see, and that'd be a small part of the points. Like if the problem is worth 15 points, then to write, to be able to write the MATLAB command might be worth a couple of points, you know. And, and the way the test works is all the points are shown to you. Like you'll see what problem is worth how many points. And you can do the problems in any order you want. I don't care. Just make sure you're clear on what problem you're working on. Because the first thing you want to do when you get an exam is read through the exam, right? Um, and then, then what you want to do, since I said you can do it in any order, is do the order that's easiest first. Like if I was taking an exam and I could do three of the, set, you know, four or five problems right off the bat and I knew I would do those first because then I'd pile up points and I'd also pile up confidence. You, you know, if you take on the first problem that you don't know how to do and spend all the time doing that and then you look at the clock and you don't have it done and times, you know, you use a lot of time, then panic can set in, right? So there's like logical things you can do to improve your performance. Don't freak out. That's one, right? Some people always tell, or not always, a few people will come to me and say, I don't test well, and I'm kind of like, you know, it's like an NFL football player saying, I don't run fast, you know, it's just, <laughs> you, you just got, it's just the way it works, right? You take tests, that's how your grades are determined. So just do your best, but don't put yourself in a position where you defeat yourself by like not sleeping or not doing, spending a lot of time on prob things on the exam that aren't with many points that you don't know how to do, you know, that's not good decision making, but it'll all be laid out, you'll see what it is. You just take five minutes like to read through the exam. It's, it's, not, it's not very long. It's on, it's on one page, okay? So it's not hard to read. And then you can see exactly what's involved. Start doing the things you know how to do first. All right? Is there anything else? Yeah? Uh, what about the homework? Are we going to get the last homework back before? Right, yes. um, you mean homework three? Written homework three? Is that what you mean? It might have been four. I don't so we haven't, you turned in one last, was it Wednesday? Is that right? Or is it Thursday? Okay, that's the one you're talking about. I'll ask, I'll ask the TA. You know what ask the TA is? That's a code for you. Send me an email and I'll remember and then I'll ask the TA. So could you just, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll ask and see if there's, it's possible to get those back. I bet she will, but I don't know for sure. Okay, a few more questions and we got to move on. Yeah. This, these are old homeworks one and two that people asked me to bring. So um, if you don't have homework one or two, you could pick it up here. 
but homework three I don't have yet. But I'll try to get. All right? So you're happy? Reasonably happy? Good. All right, so then there's a couple of other things that we should cover. Um, so you, you got the, the help thing, right? Whoops. So some of you may know this one, but in case you don't know this one, this one. Well, that's not, that's not fun. This always happens when you least can afford it, right? So there's nothing projecting up there, is there? Oh, projector looks like it's turned off, maybe. That's never happened. That's what... Anyway. I should have tested it before, but there was stuff I didn't want to project. So I'm like, I'll just plug it in because it always works. Yeah, so anyway, this is what you get. All right, what is this thing? This is for a DVD player. Oh, maybe this thing. Projector on. That could be useful. All right, so here's what I was going to say that number one, if you look at the material on hypothesis testing, you might recall that when I went through the example, I, I screwed up like sigma and sigma squared. I had a lot of sigmas where they're supposed to be sigma squared. Anyway, I corrected that slide and put, I don't know where the TA is, to be honest with you. It doesn't seem to have posted the things I sent him. I was traveling yesterday, so I sent it like last night, but I don't see it posted yet. But there's one of the things that, that's been corrected that you would probably want to look at that he should, when he posts it, say it's been corrected, but it'll be the example for hypothesis testing for the variance. It's just typos, but it will confuse you if you go to study and you're like, why is he using sigma instead of sigma squared? Okay, so that's been corrected. Um, the other, hey, the other thing that's been corrected is the following, and this has ramifications um, in several places. So let's, if you look at this um, correlation test, this, what I have, what I had written wasn't strictly correct. And, and the problem was, if you ever came up with an example where your, cor you know, your correlation coefficient can be negative, right? <coughs> the correlation, a negative co correlation coefficient just means it looks like, see those ones that have negative signs up there? Like that. Doesn't mean they're not correlated, it just means they have a negative correlation. <coughs> X goes up, the question is, does Y tend to go down or not? The problem with the way I had this written in the past, the only change I put was this, this critical absolute value of T thing. You see it way embedded in the bottom there? That's critical if R is negative, because otherwise you can never prove things are uncorrelated, okay? <laughs> All right, so, because C is always a positive number, okay? C is never a negative number if you look at the table. So that means if, T, if R is negative, it's guaranteed T will be negative, okay? So if, T, if R is negative, it's guaranteed that T will be less than C, okay? That means you'll always accept the hypothesis they're uncorrelated. That's not right, okay? So actually the book is wrong. And at one point in uh, years ago, I had absolute value of T, I think. But you know, when you get old, you don't know about these things. But, um, but it should be absolute value of T. That's really important, okay? So, and then, if you, and then you've got a practice exam, right? So the, the way I figured this out is I, the TA came to me and we started thinking, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So then I went to the web and I found an example of where they took the absolute value and I'm like, aha. But then of course, I, um, I looked at your exam, okay? This is the practice thing you got, right? So if you look at your practice exam, you'll see this is an exa exact example of what I said one should never do, right? Because R here is negative, okay? You, you'll see this when you go through. So R is negative, all right. So you see what happens is C is positive. There, C is always positive. So you see I did not take, it doesn't change the result here, but that should be the absolute value of T, right? The absolute value of T is still less than C. So the same, you get the same conclusion, but that should have been the absolute value of T there. So when you go to the practice exam, you should make a note right now that for this part, whatever part this is, let's take a look at it, that, that sh there should have been an absolute value taken here. So sorry about that. So um, looks like it is problem All 
Oh yeah, one, thank you. <laughs> so it's problem one, and so if you go down, everything I think is correct, um, except for the fact that this should be the absolute value of t. You'll get the same conclusion, but for, you know, for if, that, if, that, if that t was actually like minus two, okay, then the absolute value changes everything. Okay, so anyway, sorry about that. All right, so we're, everyone good on that? All right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, I used to do, this I think problem was taken from 2013, it's supposed to be taken from 2014, but that's okay. Um, and I used to put a greater emphasis on this because we used to have two, dis two lectures on experimental design. So I think when I presented this to you, right, I presented this material, I remember standing over there like I always do, and I said, I'm not expecting you to know how to do this. But I'm expecting you that if, if somebody says they're using such a design, you might know why they're doing it. It's good for regression modeling or something like that. So that's a long-winded way of saying, right, I wouldn't ask you to do that. But she just took the whole problem and posted it. Okay. So you might want to look at four, but it's, you, you don't have to understand how I came up with it. Because we didn't cover it enough depth for you to really do. Okay. So don't worry about it. Okay. This is a little bit of an artifact of that the course has been reorganized how it used to be and so the problems that I have to give you as examples don't correlate exactly to what we've done in class. Well, for the next group, <laughs> sure that's gratifying. Okay. All right, so the last thing here is if we look at um, the schedule, okay. So just so we're all on the same page, I guess everybody knows. So I'm going to start, so the material today is starting linear algebra which again is not ideal because we've kind of done some of this in MATLAB when we talk about vectors and matrices, so it's, but I did what I had to do. But anyway, I'll start this. It should go pretty quickly, so I hope I'll finish in time. And then um, we'll do some MATLAB tomorrow, and then we'll have the exam. And then I have another homework due next, what is that, Wednesday? It's, I figured you guys are burned out after MATLAB and the exam this week, so it's, it'll, it's just a single problem. It should probably take you a half hour to do. It's quite easy. Okay. Um, so you might say, well, he's really nice and he cares about us. The reality is I couldn't find a second problem. <laughs> but, you know, when you do the teaching evaluations, you can think the care part um, if you like. All right. So now let's go. Oh, and here was the part um, just so that, where were we? Hypothesis testing. Okay, I, sh I meant to show you this. This was, this was the slide that I corrected here, okay? Because if, if you look, you'll see that, or maybe, no, it's actually this one. Okay, before I had this, like, variances, sigma squared, sigma squared, sigma, how nice of you. Yeah, this, this is um, that one student. Oh, okay, gotcha. The rest is one more three. All right, gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Okay, your wish has come true. Just proves undergraduates are much better than graduate students when it comes to grading. If you had a grad student, you wouldn't get this back for weeks. Okay, so you can also pick this one up, but not now. Okay. All right. So sorry. So if you look at the um, here, you'll see everything sigma squared. And then when I did the I did this example, everything was sigma by it was typos. Okay. So like I changed that to sigma squared and that to sigma squared. So all you got to do is once the new lecture is posted, just look at the new lecture, but it's not posted yet. But that's the corrections that were made. All right, good. Let's talk about linear algebra. Now, linear algebra is my favorite subject because it's so perfect and so clean that nothing could be better. All right, so this starts the second part of the course. The second exam will be focused on this topic, right? None of this will be on the, the exam you're going to take on Thursday, obviously. All right, so I'm going to first of all go through an example to motivate the kind of problem we might be interested in solving with linear algebra. Okay. Um, I'll go over basic concepts, which I think I can do pretty quickly at this point. Matrices, vectors, things like this. I'll talk about how you operate on vectors uh, and matrices, how you add them, subtract them, how you multiply two matrices, how you multiply vectors, things like this. And then I'll start talking about properties of matrices, something called linear independence and something having to do with rank, something called rank of a matrix, and I'll explain to you why those are important when I get there. 
All right, so let's say you, got, you have this problem. This is actually a real problem, um, but I, I, it's an actual biochemical reaction network problem, glycolysis, if you know what that is, but I didn't want to write it that way because everyone would be blown away by like what's ATP and stuff like that. So I just simplified it to A, B, C, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the, this is the series of reactions that are taking place. So by reaction, so what's happening is these, um, so this reaction is like A being tr brought into, across a membrane, let's say, and that's D being brought from, mem from inside the membrane to outside. All these other reactions are occurring, let's say, inside a membrane, which means inside a cell. It doesn't really matter what they are. But so we have a series of reactions involving these species. Um, so A prime means it's outside the cell, A is inside the cell, D inside, D prime outside. And so you have these series of reactions. Okay, all right, um, and what we're interested in here is the, the rates of these reactions, okay? So in each case, we, the rate is called V. You know, chemical engineering, we typically call the rate R, but in this world, they call the rate V, so I just went ahead and did that. So we have eight different reactions with eight different rates, okay? The idea is that what we'd like to do when it's all said and done is we'd like to calculate these rates V1 through V6. And I'm going to assume that we know these rates because we, we can measure them typically. I won't bother explaining. Okay? All right. So first of all, I have to set up, um, in order to do this, I have to set up a, a model in order to calculate these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a steady state mass balance about each of these species, right? I'm going to do it about A, B, C, D, E, and F, and I'll explain to you in a minute why I'm not going to do it on something called E prime and F prime, because they're redundant, but let's not worry about that now, okay? So if I do this, I've got to stand over here because my neck's already hurting. If you, for example, if you look at A, okay, you also see their stoichiometry, right? You know what these reactions mean. It says you take one molecule of A you, and two molecules of F, they react to, and this means it's irreversible, right? You know, this thing, I hope. And then you get two molecules of B and two molecules of F prime, actually. All right, so let's say we want to do a steady state balance of A. That means the rate at which A is produced must equal the rate at which A is consumed. Because if that's not true, then A accumulates, and that's not steady state, okay? So we look up here and say, where is A produced? Well, this reaction makes A, right? If, it's on, if a, something's on the right-hand side, it's made. If it's on the left-hand side, it's consumed. So this reaction makes A. And this reaction consumes A, right? They both have a stoichiometry of 1. That means like VI minus V1 must be 0. Or in other words, those two rates must be equal, right? Because if that's the rate at which A is made and that's the rate at which A is consumed, those two rates better be the same, OK? Then you can do the same thing for B. So if you look um, here, this reaction makes two molecules of B or two moles, however you want to look at it, OK? And that's why I have a 2v1. The zero, this is just an, a balance equation, right? It says the rate of accumulation equals the rate in minus the rate out. That's all it's saying, okay? So that's why I have a zero over here. No accumulation. All right, so here's the rate at which B is being produced. It's got a stoichiometry of 2, and the rate of this reaction is v1. So there's a 2v1 there. It's consumed in this reaction, v2. And it's also consumed in this reaction, v6, both with a stoichiometry of 1. That's where I get those two, okay? Again, this is just saying B doesn't accumulate. If you look at C, you can see C's um, what? made in this reaction and consumed in this reaction. So V2 minus V3. D, you know, I think you're getting the idea here. Um, where is D? Produced there, consumed there, and actually consumed there. And that's where I get those equations, right there. And I do the same thing for E and F. I mean, it's just, you get the idea. Just write out. The balances that say the rate at which that molecule is generated must equal the rate at which it's consumed. Or equivalently, the difference between those two has to be zero so it doesn't accumulate. So you get these set of equations now, okay? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to solve these equations. What I'm going to assume here in a minute is that I know V1, that's the rate at which A comes in, and I know V0, that's the rate at which D goes out, and I'd like to calculate the other six things. <laughs> And it seems reasonable enough, right? Because I have six unknowns if I do that, and I have six equations, right? And if I ask you to solve this, my guess is you only know one way to solve this, and that's that, okay, I'm going to substitute, right? 
Like I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to get one equation and one unknown by substituting all these equations into each other. That works really well if you have two equations, you know, and if you have three equations, not too bad. When you start having six equations, not so good. And if you have 10,000 equations, God help you, okay? So what we want to do is come up with a systematic way of solving problems that look like this of any size, any arbitrary size, okay? And so that's what I'm going to start to show you today. All right, so this little statement here just is uh, try and convince you. And I'm sorry, the primes in MATLAB, I mean in PowerPoint, don't always look like the primes in, mat in the, in the ed equation editor. These are meant to be the same thing, you see? Both primes, but they look different, but they're not meant to be. It's life, I guess. All right, so if you come back and you, you look at E prime and you wonder why I didn't do balances on E prime and F prime, because they're all over the place. If you do a balance on E prime, just like we did, you'll get this equation here. It's produced in these two reactions with a stoichiometry of one and consumed in this reaction with a stoichiometry one. And if you look at that equation, and then you look at the equation for E, you'll see they're the same. If you take this equation and multiply it by minus one, you get that equation, okay? And if you take this equation for F, and you multiply across by minus one, you'll get that equation. So those are redundant, right? If I can take one equation and just multiply it times a constant and get another equation, there's no new information in that equation, so it's, it's redundant, I don't need it, okay? All right. So, the objective here is solve the six equations on the previous page for the six unknowns. And I, I am saying these are what I call scalar equations, right? They're written terms, you know what a scalar is, it means it's a single value. Okay, it's not a vector, and it's not a matrix, it's called a scalar. So these are scalar equations. And to solve these would be quite a bit of work, although the structure of the equations isn't so bad. So, you know, maybe you could start back substituting and get something, but it's tedious. And it's also fraught with danger, right? Because you're very likely to make an algebraic error if you start doing this. Well, that's not a great idea. It's inefficient, which we hate. Okay. So what we'd rather do is um, have a more effective way of solving these equations. So in particular, I'm, we're going to represent these linear equations like this. This is the general form of which this is an example. Okay. So what are we going to have? On the left-hand side, so this is... How many equations do we have? If you look at this, you can see there's n equations for, uh, right now, and there's n unknowns. The x's are the unknowns. There's n of them, and we have n equations, okay? These coefficients a are constants, and they're known. You know what they are. They're like the stoichiometric coefficients in the problem I just showed you. The x's are like the v's. For my problem on the previous page, all the b's are zero, but they're not always zero, okay? <coughs> So the idea is I give you all these coefficients a's, I give you all these constants b, and your job is to solve these equations for x. It's possible, perhaps, because there's n equations, there's n unknowns, right? I mean, if I give you a problem that has, um, let's say, uh, four unknowns and three equations, you've got a problem, right? Because generally speaking, you can't solve those. There won't be a solution to that problem, because you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, wait a minute, there'll be an actually an infinite number of solutions, sorry. The other case would be if I gave you three equations and two unknowns, you'd often not be able to find the two unknowns that solve the equations, okay. So what, for now, we're assuming the system is what we call square, same number of equations as unknowns, okay. And you, these, these coefficients here are not randomly numbered, right? So if you look at why, did, why why have I written this like this? Because this multiplies the first unknown in the first equation. That's the second unknown in the first equation. That's the second, that's the first unknown in the second equation. So if you look at the indexing here, you can see the first index refers to what equation you're talking about, and the second index refers to what um, unknown you're talking about. Okay? All right, so this is what we aspire to do. So within a week, we can do it. In fact, within a, within a couple of days, we're going to be able to do it. All right, so that's the kind of problem we want to solve. Now I'm just going to introduce a bunch of machinery. This is the way math, applied math works, right? To, to use things, I have to, I have to explain a bunch of things that at first you won't know why they're useful. But they will be, or I'm telling you the wrong things. All right, so some of this we can go over pretty quickly, I think. So 
We'll talk about vectors and matrices. That's what linear algebra is, basically. How do you manipulate vectors and matrices? So if I tell you something is a column vector, that means it's stacked like this. Each of these elements is a scalar, okay? And if I say it's m-dimensional, then it has m components in it. That's an example of one. This is a four-dimensional column vector, okay? Here's a row vector. Row vector just means instead of written like a column, it's written like a row, okay? And if I tell you it's an n-dimensional uh, row vector, that means it's a row vector. It has n different components. That's, an, that's a three-dimensional row vector right there, okay? We'll only be interested in this class with, um, with values, these scalars being real numbers. You can do complex and numbers, but we're not doing that, okay? All right, so here's a matrix. And you get the, idea, the indexing here, right? So if I say B2, it means the second element of this column vector. If I say A12, it means the 12th element of this row vector, whatever, okay? All right, so these matrices don't, if I'm talking about a matrix, it doesn't necessarily have to have the same number of rows and columns. So what I've depicted here is a, is a vec, as, sorry, matrix. It has M rows, right? One, two, down to M. The first index of all these A's is the number of rows. And then it has N columns. And the second index is which column you're in. Okay? So, he, so and these dots just mean, obviously, I can't, I can't write everything because I don't know what N is. <laughs> so it just says continue. That's what dots mean, right? So here's an example right here of a matrix. This is a matrix with three rows and two columns. So that particular matrix, we would say, is a three by two, right? Three rows, two columns. If a matrix is square, that means the number of rows and the number of columns are equal to each other. So when you're talking about solving equations, you'd normally like the, this matrix to be square, because then you have the same number of equa equations as unknowns. All right? Nothing too much so far. All right. So let's say we have matrices and we'd like to add or subtract them. Don't ask me why. Just assume we'll like to, okay? First of all, the matrices have to have the same dimension. They have to ex they have the exact no same number of rows and columns. Otherwise, this is not defined, this operation, okay? And to do this, you just do it element by element. So rather than give you a general formula, I just give you some examples. So let's say you have these two matrices, right? These are three by three matrices, three rows, three columns. And you want to add them. You just add them element by element. So we, we call this the 1-1 one, one element. So if you want to know what the 1-1 one, one element of C is, right? This is A, this is B, this is C. So if you want to add A and B together to get C, the way you get the 1-1 one, one element is add the 1-1 one, one elements of A and B, right? 1 plus 5 equals 6. 3 plus 2 equals 5. See a pattern developing? Minus two, minus one is minus three. So you just add these things element by element. That's how you add two matrices. That's why you can see it doesn't make any sense if they're not the same dimension to add them. Subtracting, same kind of thing. Okay, here's two matrices, two rows, three columns. So they're both two by three. So we can subtract them. And we just subtract them element by element. So we get the one, one element by subtracting the one, one elements of the two matrices. Four minus one is three, you know. 5 minus minus 4 is same as 5 plus 4, that's 9, okay? So it's not, it's not difficult. And you can imagine MATLAB is extremely efficient at this kind of thing, and I'll show you how to do that before long, okay? So this is just addition.